What's up, my set souls? It's your girl, Evie, coming back to you again with a fresh look. Uh, the name of this channel is Because Evie Said So, and I'm your host, Evie. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about all things Law and Order SVU Season 22, Episode 4, and it's called Sightless in a Savage Land. Yeah, so why don't we just go ahead and get right into it? Okay, at the opening of this episode, we find Amanda and Carisi meeting at a food truck. They're discussing New Year's Eve. Amanda invites Carisi to New Year's Eve. You know, he thinks he's going to be a, a burden. And she's like, no, you know, it's just going to be me and the girls. Why don't you just come through? So he's, he's like, well, okay, reluctantly. You know, I know they have a little thing for each other, but I don't know. They ain't hooked up yet. So I don't know if that's going to destroy their friendship. If they do that or not, um, I hope it doesn't. I mean, I would love to see them hook up, but, you know, stuff happens when you, you know, do that and you're friends, you know. Mm. Got some grape juice. I love grape juice. Anyway, I'm glad you guys are back with me. And let's just keep going right into it. So, anyway... Um, along the lines, we see that it's New Year's Eve. We see Olivia with her son. She's in Times Square and he's like watching them put the ball up. And he's like, well, mom, why is everybody, you know, why are they still putting it up and nobody can come down here? Because you knew, know that due to COVID restrictions, no one is allowed to be in Times Square to watch the ball drop. Okay. So she's like, well, we're going to watch it at home. No big deal. You know, it's not, it's nothing. We're going to watch it at home. So they agree to do that. Then I think the scene cuts to Kat and her girlfriend. Kat comes over to her house. She all dressed up and everything. She looking good. And her girlfriend's looking good. They looking all celebratory. And um, we see her go in there and they start dancing, right? So then we, I think we cut to the scene with Finn and Phoebe. And in the morning, right before all of this starts, he's telling her how beautiful she is. And you can see the look in his eye that he really loves her. Uh, that he's infatuated her, at least that. So we know that more than likely Finn and Phoebe are together, right? As far as for this evening, I mean. And we do see them in the restaurant eventually together. So we know that's happening. We see Olivia and her son at home. And we see them watching the ball drop. And then all of a sudden, oh, well, we do see Carisi come over. And he comes over and he's so good with the girls. And we see them sitting down getting ready to watch everything on TV too. So then all of a sudden, um, they start getting these pages, right? So, and I really like this episode, right? Okay, so let me just get comfortable. Okay, so we, we, we hear all of them getting a page. Essentially, their phones is going off. And what is it? It's an Amber Alert. <laughs> Okay, but SVU doesn't usually handle Amber Alerts, right? So it must be something serious. So we cut to the to the chase and we get to where the Amber Alert is issued from. And we see it's a family. And the father's name is AJ. The mom's name is Ronnie. We hear that this guy works through the ACS in the police department with them. So he's some guy, big, big, high up. And um, his foster child has ran away. So he thinks that she's been snatched inside a white van. So, of course, you know, they're like on this immediately because it's an Amber Alert. You know, when children are missing, we got to find them, okay? So we see that they're asking him some questions and they're outside and they're like, well, you know, where do you think she might be? You know, do you think she has a boyfriend, et cetera, et cetera. And the mom, Ronnie is like, well, she could have gone with her mom. Her mom's a junkie. So um, she could have went with her or maybe the mom's pimp from the past kidnapped her because he drives a white van. So now they're really panicking. They're like, okay, let's go get this guy. So they set it up where they find out where he is. Well, first of all, in order to do that, they got to find out where he is, right? So they go find the mom, right? Okay, she's outside of a liquor store drinking. And they're like, you ain't working your program. And she's like, look, give me a break. It's New Year's Eve. And they're like, look, we're going to report you if you don't help us find your daughter. And she's got this whole nonchalant attitude like, I don't even care where she is, okay? So they corner her. She tells them she's going to call the pimp reluctantly. They get the information as to where he is. They go. Finn sets it up like he's going to, you know, buy a girl or whatever to have relations with the girl. 
and um they ended up busting this guy and he's like look i don't do kids okay so i don't even have her the girl's name that's missing is is nydia so they don't have nydia so they see that and they and then as they're taking all these girls out that are working this truck okay prostitutes can we just be real with it it's prostitution so they they get them out and after they get them out they get a call what's happened now well, what's happened is they found Nydia. And where did they find her? They found her in a park and she's bleeding out. So, you know, Amanda and Olivia rush right to the ER. They go in the ER. They talk to the doc right quick. The doc's like, look, she good and everything, but she was bleeding so badly. We ended up having to do a DNC. And they're like, a DNC? And she's like, yeah, she was pregnant. She was about eight weeks along. Okay, wait a minute. Ain't this girl 13? She's 13 years old. And she's pregnant. Okay, something is awry here. So now they're like, okay, so can we ask you some questions, Nydia? And she's like, yeah, you can ask me some questions. And they're like, well, did you take the abortion pill? Because it was in your system. Did you want to get rid of the baby? Mm, pudding. And she's like, no, I wanted my baby. And she's like, look, I would never do that. You know, and they're like, well, you were in the park, honey, and they found you. And she's like, no, 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 that's not true. She was like, AJ brought me to the hospital. And they're like, no, no, he didn't. He didn't bring you to the hospital. And she's like, he had to. We're in love. What? And she's like, yeah, we're in love. So they're like, well, okay. So now that's a bomb, bam, dropped, okay, it's in their face. So now they have to deal with it. So they get back after talking to her to the station, and they want to bring in the foster parents, of course. Now, the foster parents are already there because they want to speak to, um, they want to speak to Nydia. And Nydia's like, they're like, well, we're not going to let you talk to them right now. Let's just go in here. Let's ask you some questions and, and see what's, what's going on here. And AJ, the foster father, goes in there with them. And he's like, well, I would have told y'all she really didn't run away. But I knew you guys really wouldn't look for her. So I had to make up a story that she was stolen, that she was kidnapped. And um, they were like, okay, you know, that, all right. Well, you know, we're going to forgive that. But, um, you know, she's, you know in the hospital she says that you took her to the hospital and he's like no i didn't she's making this up you know she must have been out there with a boyfriend or something now she's trying to blame me she is a problem child she's been getting on a nurse she's been doing this she's been doing that all the time and and um we're just sick of it basically but we love her pretty much and we're trying to do our best by her and they're like well then it will bother you to find out that she's pregnant right amanda drops that bomb He's like, what? I'm sorry, say what? And he's and she's like, yeah, she's she's pregnant, eight weeks along. And he's like, well, let me go talk to her. Maybe I can find out, you know, what's going on with her. They're like, no, we're not having that. Let's talk to you. And then a fan is like, well, do you know who the dad is? And he's like, I don't know. What did she tell you? And he's like, well, she told me it was yours. And he's like, no, 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 this ain't, that's not what's happening here. Um, let me just go talk to her, holler at her for a minute. They're like, no, that's not going to happen. You're not going to go talk to her. Why don't we just clear this up, Amanda says. Just give us a specimen. We'll clear it up. You know, you can get on out of here. And he's like, well, that would really affect my job. Something like this could ruin me. So let me ask my boss. And then, by the way, I think I might need a lawyer, too. So he throws that out nonchalant, like they're not listening to him. So then Finn's like, well, I understand girls lashing out. I have two teenage daughters myself. Amanda looks at him like, no, you don't. <laughs> and he looks, he doesn't even look back at her because he knows she's going to go with the program. He's just doing that so he can build up a rapport with AJ so he can try to get some more information out of him. But once he has said that he wants a lawyer, it's nothing else they can do. So Carisi, Olivia, and Chief Garland are back behind the glass and they're watching everything that AJ has said to them. And so Carisi's like, look, she didn't get pregnant by herself. Who else is in the house? They're like, well, there's a couple more foster girls, a pair of twins, and I think it's another little boy. And he's like, well, you know what? Go in there, get the computers and everything, and we're going to get some um, records for the phones. We're going to find out. 
meantime olivia has already done this she's already got the phone records and she um she's ordering everything that he particularly needs and so at this point chief garland just wants to know can they get fetal um dna from the baby and she's like well no it's a complicated procedure plus the baby's gone you know the baby has you know has passed on and he's like oh okay well i guess that that's burnt pretty much um so at this point, they're just going to have to play it by ear. They're going to have to work the program like they're supposed to, work all the clues, and see what's up. Um, obviously, she said she didn't take the abortion pill by herself, so somebody had to give it to her, okay? So I've been watching this way too long to know that there's something in something, and I'm leaning toward the foster father at this point because I don't know. He just looked guilty. He looked like he hiding something, y'all. So, okay, let's get into it. So after talking to him and now he's lawyered up, now they're trying to run and see um, what they can get and what they can get as far as information from the records and stuff that they have. Now, she might have had a boyfriend, possibly. We don't really know. But from the phone records, it you know, they find out that she is talking to someone, texting someone every day. And that someone happens to be her real father, Mickey. Now, what do they do? We see the scene cut away. They're going to Mickey's. Um, they talk to him. He's at the VA hospital. We see that he is a wounded veteran. He has lost his leg for the service of his country. We commend him on his service. And we see that he is a loving father, that he talks to her every single day, and that he wants very badly that when he gets out of there, he wants to make a home for Lyd Nydia and himself. Okay, but he's still injured. He's working, you know, to try to see if he can get better. So anyway, they ask him, Finn says, well, what do you know about this foster guy? You know, what do you know about the foster family? And he's like, well, they always been pretty nice to me. You know, the foster father has always brought Nydia to me. And the only thing I noticed about him is that sometimes he's kind of protective. And he's like, well, protective how? And he's like, I don't know, just kind of protective. But I, I like him. So no big deal. So he um, feels bad that Nydia has been in a home before this. She was in a group home and she's run away from that before and she had some problems before. He feels bad that her mom is a junkie. He says he's lost his wife. He lost his leg. But the hardest part about all of it is that he lost his daughter. You know, he's a really good dad and he really just wants to be there for her. So we see that um, Finn understands and Finn wants to be there for him because Finn is a great guy. You know, he's a great cop. He's a great guy. And he tells him from one ranger to another, if you ever want me to go with you to see your daughter, call me. And he gives him his card. I thought that was so wonderful, you know. So I was like, wow. So anyway, after that, they go back to Olivia and they tell her, you know, the father's on the up and up. You know, he, he's good. We're not going to really look at him for this. And um, I guess what happens then is that they just work to find out what exactly is going on in that home. Because the Sharmas, Ronnie and AJ, something's going on. I mean, this girl didn't just run away or, or did she, you know? So what we see is Carisi indicates that this guy is probably just an experienced groomer, which basically means that this guy is so slick at what he does that, you know, they don't even notice him and him being in the foster care family, you know, business. Um, he's had various other families in there too, various other girls. They're going to dig it out. So anyway, Amanda, while they're talking about this, she gets some info because they've been trying to get these warrants for the computers. Remember? So they got the warrants and on the history of AJ's computer, it seems he been trying to erase his history. Yes. Okay. Big surprise there. He's been trying to erase his history on his computer because he's been looking up abortion drugs. I mean, he's been making her smoothies from what Lydia has told them that he's been making her smoothies every day. So it looks like essentially with the medications that he was looking up and that he had requested, he had been slipping her the abortion drug in her smoothies. So, yeah. So Olivia gets a warrant for the blender and she tells Finn to pick him up. Okay. So she picks him up at this point. You know, Finn is visibly upset and shaken because before he goes to pick him up, he realizes he has to go back to Mickey and tell Mickey what happened to his daughter. 
So the next scene we see is we cut to the courtroom and it's AJ's arraignment because they've arrested him. And we see Mickey come in there via his wheelchair and he sits next to Finn and Finn's like, I didn't think you wanted to, you know, see this. And he's like, look, I just need him to look me in the eye, you know, because of what he did to my daughter. I need him to be a man. And he tells Finn he wants to confront him just face to face. So um, we see the lawyer in there pleading for AJ's case. And he's like, look, he's a great guy. He has been no problems in the community. He's not a flight risk. The judge ain't trying to hear none of that. Okay. None of that. He like, period. We don't care about no good citizen. You in here raping people. Okay. I'm going to hit you with the second degree rape, the third degree rape and official misconduct. And of course he pleads not guilty. Right. But the judge is not trying to hear none of that. He like everybody doing some time today. He like, so he remands him to custody. So they take AJ's dirty behind up out of the courtroom and in handcuffs and he's going to Rikers. Now, for all the fans out there of SVU, Law and Order, Law and Order SVU, we know Rikers is not the place to be when you've been raping kids, okay? First of all, that's a hard prison and they're going to take him to Rikers, so that's a bad place, so he should be worried, okay? So Finn tells Mickey, he's like, I'm going to take you back to the VA. And he's like, okay. So he says, but let me smoke first. So Finn says, okay, I'm going to meet you downstairs outside. No biggie. So the scene cuts to outside. We see Mickey in his wheelchair sitting outside the police van, and he's smoking his cigarette. He's smoking, sitting there like, you know, he eyeballing the van. Now, I'm from the shy. First of all, I see something. I know something. I know y'all peeped it out too, fans of SVU out there. Y'all know he was on something. I mean, I don't know why Finn didn't realize it, but that wouldn't have been a good story, right? So anyway, Finn has to take a call right quick because his phone is ringing. So now he got to take the call. He takes his eyeballs off of Mickey. They bring out AJ in handcuffs. They about to put him in the van. What happens? <laughs> Oh, okay. You want me to tell you what happens? You know what happens. So Mickey's like, AJ. AJ looks up. He shoots him. Boom, boom, boom. Three times, point blank. He dead. Now, Finn is like, what did you do? So he's grabbing Mickey. He's trying to get the gun. Mickey drops the gun, hands up. He's like, he won't tell Finn why he did it. He, all he starts quoting is that his name is Mickey this, and he quotes his um, rank and serial number, okay? His, his number for um, his rank. So that's all he's going to say. So essentially, he ain't got nothing else to say. I mean, everybody knows why he shot him. He quotes the service number over and over again. Now, this man ain't got about 45 guns pointed toward him. If it was someone else, you know something else would happen. But, you know, anyway, they do not shoot him. He's now under arrest. And the next scene takes us to a restaurant with Olivia and Finn and guess who? Barba. Barba is back. Barba is back. I love him. Like that man is so intelligent. <clears throat> My heart was thumping. I was so excited to see him. And Olivia and Finn start telling him about Mickey. And they like, hypothetically, if we had a client and um, if we arrested this guy because he shot this guy three times point blank because he raped his daughter was raped by him in the foster care, uh, you know, system, you know, what would you do? And Barbara's like, well, I heard about the case and basically this guy is guilty. You know, it's nothing I can do. And he's like, what you should be worrying about is your case and Finn, your case, because I heard ain't too, you know, stuff ain't going too good for y'all right now. And they like, well, look, look, hold up. We want to deal with this first. Then we, you know, we might hire you after that. So he reminds them, of course, that this guy is guilty even though he's a six decorated veteran with PTSD and he's disabled because he lost his leg and he lost his child in the system and his wife turned out to be a junkie should, you know, that he should take the case. And Barbara and Carisi, he, he wants to know, does Carisi even know you're here asking me about this? Because Carisi is the assistant district attorney. So this is his ballpark. So they're like, no, he doesn't even know we're here. So he's like, okay, so they like, that's why we called you because we know, you know, you good like that, that you can do things. And he looks at them and he starts sipping his coffee or his tea. 
Like, you know I am, right? You know I'm good. So I love it because he knows he's just that good, right? So anyway, the next thing we see is Barba. He's going to Creasy's office. He's trying to fill him out to try to find out what he can find out about this case. Well, Chrissy ain't telling them that much. And then Chrissy's like, wait a minute, you asking all these questions. Are you representing Mickey? And he's like, well, I guess I am at this point. And he's like, okay, come on, sit down. He's like, Chrissy's like, look, I'm going to give him three and a half years because really he don't deserve to go to jail as far as for why he had to do it. But what he did was wrong. It's guilty. No vigilante justice out here. It's enough stuff in the world right now. We don't need to deal with this. And Barbara's like, nah, nah, we're not going to do no three and a half years. Matter of fact, we're not going to do no time at all because I'm going to convince the jury that Mickey's really not guilty. He said, well, what are you doing? You going for the insanity plea? He like, no, all I need them to do. I need 12 jurors to like me. And like my client, and I bet you I can get him off. And he's like, so you want them to ignore the law? And he's like, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much that's what I'm going to do. Because you know, and I know, that this guy has a purple heart. That he basically, he did what he did because what happened, happened. And that's just that. So Carissa's like, okay, I'll see you in court. So now is the court off, okay? Like, Carisi versus Barbara, Barbara versus Carisi. Oh my God. He was defending his daughter, right? Mickey was. So Barbara goes to the prison to introduce himself to Mickey. And Mickey tells him, he says, well, I don't want no charity, right? And he's like, look, this ain't charity, dude. I'm taking this case because you right. And he's like, even though you did what you did, we understand. So Finn is like, just, you know, just take the, the you know, let him help you. So Mickey is shaken up. Because not only did he, you know, his daughter was raped and was pregnant, ended up losing her baby, and now he shot this man, but his daughter won't even talk to him because he killed the man she loved. So now he's really shaken. So Deputy Chief Garland ends up coming into a conversation as we go into the next scene where Barbara is actually having a conversation with Finn and Kat and Amanda. Well, luckily, Olivia cuts uh, D Deputy Chief Garland off at the pass. She opens the door and is like, how you doing, Chief? And everybody like, you know, shuts up. So she allows him in so he can be in there. He gets Barbara to the side. He's like, look, Barbara, let me holler at you for a minute. Come on over here. So he takes him to Olivia's office. He like, um, you're not doing what I think you're doing, right? Because you don't really work here no more. So you ain't really pumping them for information and trying to use your sway up in here, right? And he's like, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just having some friendly conversation with my friends. And Olivia's like, yeah, we just reminiscing, right? And he's like, right. <laughs> okay, right. And so Garland's like, I'm not stupid. He's like, this is what I'm going to tell you. It's too much stuff going in the world for vigilante justice to be out here and for you to be trying to be um, using your sway to get in here to try to, you know, influence anybody. So stop it. So he's like, okay, I got you, basically. Um, I'm not doing that, but if I was doing that, I would stop it. So anyway, so um, Carisi and him, the next thing we see is them in there choosing jurors. OK, and y'all know the process. I don't know. Well, maybe you don't. I don't know if you know the process of an actual courtroom case in that, you know, the, the defense and the prosecution get to pick jurors and they get to pick them based on things they like and they dislike. So they start asking them questions. Have you ever been a victim of gun violence? Have you ever um, been in the army or any kind of service? Do you have any children in the foster care system? Some of those things will weed them out. It means that they would stand one way or the other. And the prosecution, of course, wants a guilty verdict. So he's going to pick people he thinks is going to lean toward him. And the defense is going to do the same. So we see them bargaining back and forward, asking these jurors. They finally get 12 jurors who commit to the fact that they're going to be there for this case. <clears throat> and we can see that Carisi is a little upset about it because he's in his office down in Pepto-Bismol because y'all got to understand, Carisi used to watch Barbara work. Like he would go to all his cases to see what his summations would be, how he would present his cases. So for him, this is a big thing because not only is he had to defend or prosecute Mickey, which he truly doesn't really believe he should have to, but because of what Mickey did, he has to. 
he also has to go up against Barba, okay? So anyway, we see them going before the court. Um, we see them uh, with their opening arguments and Barbara's is all everything. He's like, look, I'm going to present to you the case. You know, this is what happened. What, what would you do if someone raped your daughter? Um, not just that, but this guy is a decorated veteran. He's got PTSD. He didn't really know what he was doing at the time. He just saw rage and he wanted to defend his daughter because he's from, he was in Afghanistan and that was his job to defend them against the Afghanistan people that were trying to go against them, um, the Iraqis and everything they were trying to fight against. And, and over there, they were raping a lot of women and children. So that's what he was trained to do. And Carice is like, that's nice, but you can't go around shooting people because you feel like it. You know, you're in America. You know, you need to come back, get yourself together and realize you're not in Afghanistan. And so eventually Mickey takes the stand. And uh, Barbara does his best to protect him, but under um, redirect questioning, Carisi gets him to admit that, yeah, he did shoot him and he would do it again. Now, leave a comment below. I want to know what you think because this guy shot and killed this man in cold blood because he raped his daughter. He raped his daughter. He impregnated his daughter. She ended up losing the baby. She's in love with this man under derision. She don't even know what she's thinking at 13 years old. Her whole world is rocked. Would you have shot him? I mean, you ain't got to answer it like that. But do you, I mean, do you understand how he would possibly feel? You can say in the comments below, I understand what he felt. Or you can say what you want to say because that's your business, like Tabitha Brown tells us all the time. Okay, hi, Tabitha. But anyway, getting back to this. Personally, I, I, I understood. I have two daughters. I understood. Not saying I wouldn't have done that, but I thoroughly understood why he did it. I can say that. And I'm not condoning violence or vigilante justice or anything like that. I can say as a mom, if that happened to my daughter... I can understand why he felt like he had to do it, okay? So leave a comment below. I know this is a deep episode and it's going a little bit beyond the time I really want to discuss it, but it's so deep. Every time I get into SVU, y'all, it really, um, it just gets me. It gets me because it's real life situations, real things that actually happen. And these are the way these cases are basically handled. Now we did see some social distancing and we did see some masks in this episode. So we did see that a little bit more than we did with Meet Me in Quarantine. And I'm not going to go into that particular episode because that will upset me a little bit. And um, I, I might cover it later, you know, might do a catch up as far as the season. But we, we just going to go with this one for right now. So I don't know. I kind of mad at Olivia. And I know like that last time I was mad at Olivia. Well, I don't know. She just keep pissing me off this, this season because look, she telling Barbara, you can't defend him on those grounds. And Barbara's like, but you called me. You called me in here to do this. And she's like, I know I called you, but you can't defend a guilty man. And he's like, who said I can't? You asked me to come up in here. So yeah, I'm kind of ticked because her and Finn are the reason they pulled him back into this situation. So when he gets up there, um, like I said, Mickey has already admitted that he would do it again. So I think that's what, you know, got him convicted. And yeah, I said convicted because the original three and a half years that Carisi was going to give him in the first place, that's what the jury hit him with. Now, had he not admitted that, would they have given him any time? I don't know. Because the way that Barbara presented his, his argument was so eloquent, was so well-mannered and said and it presented a lot of questions to the jurors about their own perspectives for their own children if this was the situation. And I truly believe, I do, if he hadn't have said that, Mickey hadn't admitted that he would do it again and that he did shoot him for those reasons. Because not only did Carisi prove that he wanted to shoot him, he said, look, you smuggled the gun in. You know how to get the gun. The gun wasn't even with you. So you have to leave the VA, go to a friend's house, get the gun, come back, smuggle the gun into the courtroom. And he said, because of my wheelchair, I knew they weren't going to really search me. So you had to think 
about all of this. So technically, was it considered premeditated murder? Because he lucky they hit him and gave him three and a half years because if you walk away from a situation and you go get a gun and you retrieve that gun and you bring it back to that scene, you've had plenty of time between here and there to think rationally, to think I might not do that. I shouldn't do that. So there, he's real lucky they didn't hit him with premeditated murder at this point. So yeah, Barbara lost this one. But he did ask Carisi, let's see if you've been paying attention to when you were watching me. And obviously he was because Carisi got a win. As nervous as he is, as busy as he runs around like a chicken with his head cut off, he's always so nervous. His stomach is always so raw. I feel sorry for him because he's really good. Carisi is a great ADA. He just needs to believe that more. Now, we see Barbara and Olivia at the end of the episode. We see them um, outside of the um, a restaurant because um, Finn has officially proposed to his girlfriend, Phoebe. So we saw the ring earlier when he showed it to Olivia and Olivia was like, she's going to love it. She's not going to say no. So he informs everybody that he has now proposed. She has accepted. They're celebrating Carisi's win. And um, he, Finn still says, I don't think he should have done a day. I don't think Mickey should have done any time at all. So we know how he feels. And come to find out, Finn is the one who called Barbara, not Olivia. So am I still pissed at Olivia? Yeah, a little bit. Just a little bit. I'm still pissed at her because it's her squad. You know what I'm saying? And even though Finn called, she still went and backed him up with Barbara and asked Barbara the question about would he represent Mickey. And then you mad because the way he handled it, he did his thing. I was glad to see him. So outside, they meet outside and she's like, I'm going to go in here. He's like, yeah, but I got to go. And she's like, um, <clears throat> basically they hug each other and she's like, I'm glad to see you. I wish it had been under, you know, better circumstances. He's like, no problem. You know, I still love you. And then he walks off and she stands there and she looks at him real sad. You know, she looks at him sad because I think she sees him in a different perspective. Not just that, not in a bad, bad perspective, but as her friend, you know, should she have dragged him into this y'all? I mean, comment below if you think she really shouldn't have dragged him into this. Not that a public defender wouldn't have been able to handle this case, but I think she wanted Mickey to have a little bit more than just a public defender. And public defenders do a great job. They are overworked, underpaid, and they still do a great job. So kudos to y'all out there that are doing this stuff on the real every single day. But to my, my people out there, to my said souls out there, and my lovers of SVU, Law & Order SVU. We love this show. We were so glad to see Barbara come back. I was, at least. Were you? I mean, let me know. I look forward to talking to you guys again. Sorry I didn't bring you a video from Meet Me in Quarantine or the one before that. But on the real, we're going to be talking about it. I love SVU. Been watching it for 20-something years. And I know there are people out there like you that have done that too. So... If you like the content from, from today, please like, go ahead and smash that like button, go ahead and share to your friends or to other people that you know would love this content and feel free to subscribe. I would love to have you here. I thank you guys for coming, for being part of the best part of my day for today besides my children, but the best part of my day. I love you guys. I feel like I'm going to reach out to you again soon. Let's see what happens next week. Okay. Let's see and discuss. I love you guys. So for me, it was a positive review with a little side of shade. All right. I love you guys. Bye-bye.